Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to East Brady Baptist Church's worship service online for the week of January 24th, 2021. I'm so glad you could join us for worship today, wherever you happen to be. It is a great day to come and worship our great God. Uh, hey, as always, you're watching online. If you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, if you want to leave us a comment so that we can know that you're there and we can know how you're doing, that would be great. I love hearing from you. I love interacting with you as this video goes out live on Facebook. Uh, so just go ahead and do that and uh, we'll be sure to see those comments as they come in throughout the week. Let us start our worship with our call to worship, which is this week taken from Psalm 100. Enter the Lord's gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name, for the Lord is good and his love endures forever. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we confess that despite your presence with us, we are reluctant to go forward in faith in our daily lives. We don't want to step out of the boat. We're afraid to walk with you. We're doubting, troubled, and timid. We lack commitment and trust. Forgive us, O Lord, for our sin. Renew within us a vivid awareness that you are with us and for us. May this awareness make it possible to go where you want us to go, do what you want us to do, and to give your name glory. We pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. Before our announcements today, I just want to review some things with you since we're, we're remaining online. Worship in our building is, is still not open for in-person worship. Hey, our online worship is available starting Sundays at 10.30 a.m. on our website at www.eastbradybaptist.com. So if you can't access it on Facebook or you know someone who can't uh, or you miss it, go, go, you can go to our website anytime after Sundays at 10.30 a.m. and watch our worship service there. If you do watch us on Facebook, uh, but somehow miss the service when it goes out live, you can uh, just watch the service anytime after that then. Just go to the church group and click on the video and you can watch it. And as always, uh, don't hesitate to let your friends and family know that they can watch us online too in these ways. Um, just uh, one last brief thing before we move on with the service. If there's someone, if you're a regular part of our congregation, there is somebody who, who uh, is a regular part of our congregation who you haven't really interacted with in a while since we're not meeting in person. This is a great week to go ahead and do that, to, to uh, give them a call on the telephone, send them a note or a card or an email or, or a message on Facebook, just a short comment. Let them know you're thinking about them. I'm sure that they would love to hear from you. Remember, we are a community of believers even when we can't be together on Sunday mornings in person. Uh, that's all for announcements today, uh, which moves us into our time of prayer and praises. As always, if you've got a prayer request or something you're praising God for, go ahead and put it in the comments if you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, and we'll see those, and we will pray for you and with you, and we will praise God uh, with you as well. So uh, go ahead and put those there. That said, let us turn to the Lord in prayer. Dear God, our Heavenly Father, we come before you after another week. And we are just so grateful that, that you are still with us, that you abide with us, God. That once again, you call us into your presence uh, for joint worship, God. Uh, we thank you for that. We thank you that, that through your son, Jesus Christ, we have forgiveness of sins so, so that we can approach you, we can be with you. God, we have the promise of that, not just now, but forever. So thank you. Thank you for Christ and all that you have given us in him and, and through him. God, we thank you for your Holy Spirit who, who comes and lives in, in every believer. So he, he is there in us now, guiding us, watching over us, taking care of us, pointing us in the right direction so that we are never alone, God, that your presence goes with us everywhere, every day. So thank you. We thank you for the wonderful things that you are doing in our individual lives, God, and we remember them now and we recount them to you, uh, perhaps in the privacy of our own homes. And we just give you thanks. We thank you that uh, throughout this past week, uh, we had a peaceful transition of power in this nation, which is something that makes the United States remarkable, God. You've just given that to us and many people in so many other countries 
just don't know what that's like. Uh, so we thank you that that was peaceful, God. Uh, still uh, a stressful time as uh, so many people uh, are, are so happy about our, our new president and so many are just very dissatisfied. Uh, so uh, we pray for peace. We pray for peace of mind, God. We pray that for your will to go forward in this nation through President uh, Joe Biden and his administration. We pray that you watch over them and uh, you give them wisdom, God. Help them to be your people for this time. God, uh, we pray for all our elected leaders, uh, for those who are for you and even those who, who aren't mindful of you, God, or have turned away from you. We, we pray that you use them to bring about your good purposes in this land and in this world and in this time. Uh, but God, uh, beyond that, we pray for some other things. We all know people who are sick uh, and, and need prayer, God. So, so we remember them to you right now. Those who are sick, maybe from something that's been ongoing for a long time, or maybe from just something uh, temporary and new, God. We'll remember whether it's uh, emotional or mental or physical, whether it's a disease or an illness or otherwise, God. We, we pray for them. We remember them. We ask that you heal them. We ask that you give them strength. We ask that you help them to persevere and that they know your presence through the struggle. God, we pray for those who mourn and grieve the loss of a loved one, the loss of a situation that was dear to them. God, uh, the hurt that they are feeling, the lostness, uh, we pray that you reach down into that and let them know your presence. Let them know your peace. Let them know your joy. Let them know your purpose beyond what they are experiencing right now, God. Let them know your comfort. God, we pray uh, regarding coronavirus. As we, we have been all along, we continue to bring it before you because we know that our salvation from this comes only from you. God, most likely you're going to use uh, very uh, human-looking means to do it, but we know it's from you. So we pray uh, for our doctors, that you give them wisdom to treat people. You give them compassion. You give them perseverance, God. You protect them. And we pray for those who have coronavirus, that you would heal them that you would get them through, God, that you would strengthen them. We pray for all those who don't have it, that you would protect them, that they wouldn't get it, God. We, we pray, we thank you for these people who are and have been working on this vaccination, and we thank you for the success that we are experiencing from that. God, help it to get to everybody who needs it, and God, uh, just help us to be uh, peaceable people, mindful people, wise people, people who aren't self-focused during this time. <sighs> that we might endure it and come through it by your grace, God. God, we pray for your church, places in the world where our brothers and sisters are in danger because they worship you. We pray that you help them. We pray that you strengthen their faith, you keep them safe, and that you deliver them. God, we pray for the church in the United States where uh, we look and God in so many ways. Uh, we have kind of committed idolatry with the things we have chased after and, and kind of set ahead of you uh, in terms of what we use to decide what our lives should be. But God, it's all about you and your word. So help us to turn back to that. Forgive us for our waywardness and just uh, revive us through your Holy Spirit. God, give us a deep desire in our hearts for you and for your way. And then use us to go forth and to love others. Love others in the church, beyond the church, and to speak the words of love in your gospel that they would hear and know and believe God but send great revival upon this nation, that we might be a nation under God. God, we pray for our town of East Brady and the surrounding communities, uh, th that you would help the people uh, who are there, help our friends and neighbors who uh, have different uh, troubles, different things that they are dealing with. God, help us to see that and help us to see how, how we can come alongside them and love them and maybe help them. But God, open our eyes because so often we have a desire, but we just don't know how to, to fulfill that and to go out and help people. So, so let us know. God, we pray all these things in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, we turn now to our time uh, of teaching. And I'm going to read to you in a moment from the Gospel of Luke chapter 3, starting at verse 1. So if you've got your own Bible at home there, or if you've got an electronic device that, that you use uh, to read your Bible, won't you open it to Luke chapter 3? And as always, when we are here online, I am going to put the words of this passage up on the screen for you as I read it. <laughs> so we read, 
at Luke chapter 3, starting at verse 1. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod, tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, tetrarch of Ituria and Trachonitis, and Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all the country around the Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill made low. The crooked roads shall become straight and the rough ways smooth, and all people will see God's salvation. John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children of Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. What should we do? The crowd asked. John answered, Anyone who has two shirts should share with the one who has none, and anyone who has food should do the same. Even the tax collectors came to be baptized. Teacher, they asked, what should we do? Don't collect any more than you are required to, he told them. Then some soldiers asked him, and what should we do? He replied, don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. May the Lord add his blessing to this reading and hearing of his holy word. Well, today our passage introduces us to John the Baptist as an adult, this distant cousin of Jesus who, in scriptures, we've already met earlier in the Gospel of Luke chapter 1, uh, and that account we often read around Christmas time where Mary's cousin Elizabeth is pregnant and she gives birth to the boy named John. Well, this is that John, except for today we come to him as an adult. And, and as your pastor, <laughs> I, I have to admit, I, I mean... <sighs> I'm somewhat bored by John the Baptist, and I know that seems like sacrilege for a pastor to say, especially for a Baptist pastor to say he, he's bored by John the Baptist. And it's not as though I don't recognize the great importance of John and his message. It's just that talking about John, it's not really that exciting to me. Uh, truth be told, this week I almost changed my whole preaching calendar just so I could avoid talking about John the Baptist today. Because, hey, for whatever reason, he just bores me. I think it's because all the John the Baptist stuff kind of seems like preliminary stuff before you get to the good stuff, before you get to the Jesus stuff. Just give me the good stuff. Just give me the Jesus stuff. But my plan all along has been between Christmas and Lent, which, which starts next month, uh, is to preach through the, the gospel counts early in the gospels that lead up to Jesus' public ministry. A lot of times Jesus is an essential figure there. And I knew that to do that, it was going to take me through John the Baptist. And, and so when I came to it this week, really wasn't surprised, uh, but I was like, well... Maybe I should just do a different preaching calendar, a different uh, plan for preaching. After all, no one knows that that's what I I'm planning now. But the Spirit of God just kind of bopped me on the head and said, nope, you dope, this is where I'm going, you need to follow me. So I followed him. And so today we talk about John the Baptist. And, and having looked into it even further in preparation for this message, I'm so glad we do talk about John the Baptist today. Because John's message is so vital to us even today as followers of Jesus. Let's not skip over it. Because you see, in John's day, there were a lot of people, even in his day, who wanted to skip over John and his message. They wanted to ignore him and what he was saying to them. And because so many in his day ignored John's message, then they weren't ready for Jesus when he came onto the scene. And, and so just as they had dismissed John, well, they made the mistake of dismissing Jesus too. Because John's entire ministry was about preparing people for Jesus. So, hey, do you want more of Jesus in your life? And I hope your answer is yes. I hope your answer to that is always a resounding, enthusiastic, yes, I want more Jesus in my life. You want to know more of his love? You want to know more of his forgiveness, more of his freedom? You want to know more of his salvation and his care and his plan for your life? 
then you first need the message of John the Baptist because it prepares you for Jesus in your life. See, John prepared the people of his day for Jesus by telling them what Jesus is all about, repentance. See, verse 4 in our passage today tells us, hey, John, he's the guy that the prophet Isaiah wrote about hundreds of years before and said someone would come to prepare the way for the Lord, the Lord who we now know was Messiah Jesus. Well, that's John. He's the one who's doing that. And verse 3 then, Luke tells us how he did it. It says, John came preaching a baptism for repentance for the forgiveness of sins. You want to be prepared for more of Jesus in your life? then you've got to repent for the forgiveness of sins. See, there are two big things in that statement. One, forgiveness of sins, and two, repentance. And we're going to look at each of them briefly here before we move on. First, forgiveness of sins. It's hugely important because sin is what causes us to die. Did you know that? I mean, the biblical indication is that before sin was in the world, before there was rebellion against God in the world, there was no death. And God created Adam and Eve with all these animals, puts them in the garden, and, and, and nothing there died until there was sin. We die because of sin. You know, there's been some commotion over these past months regarding why some people are dying. You know, in our culture, when someone dies, there's usually a death certificate, and we'll write on that death certificate the cause for death. And often it'll just be uh, natural causes, right? Which is just a blanket statement for dying of something that's just nonspecific. But sometimes, you know, it will be a specific thing listed, uh, like complications from cancer or pneumonia. But it seems a number of deaths over these past months have been attributed on their death certificates to coronavirus, even if the person had a pre-existing condition or, or died of some other symptoms. And some people, they're annoyed by that. And they're saying, hey, this is just padding the numbers of deaths caused by this pandemic for political reasons, they say. Well, whether you agree with them or not, it doesn't matter because no matter what we put on a death certificate, ultimately what every person in this world dies of is sin. We all die of sin because sin causes death and we have all got sin. That's what the Bible says. We're all sinners. And because we have this sin, we are condemned to hell. Hell is an eternal death and that's where sin sends us. So we've got this sin and there's nothing we can do to get rid of it. And, you know, some people think, hey, if you do enough good stuff, you can cancel your own sin. Like, you can overwrite it. Kind of like when, when, when you save a file on a computer over an old file. You know, you just save over it. You know, they think, well, you do enough good stuff, you can, you can just cover all, all, all your sin. The problem with that is you are already soaked in sin. You start there in this bad, dirty place of rebellion and, and, and your shortcomings against God. So how then, starting from that place of sin, how can you ever be good enough in that place to do anything that's good, that is good enough to overcome that place you start in? You see, you can, which means you've got sin, you're stuck with it. And, and, and that sin condemns you to hell. Which means we all start off destined for hell. As sin for humans, it's our default setting. I, I know people think often that we're all destined for heaven to start off with unless we get off track and do something heinous and really, really bad like disobey the crossing guard or something. And, and then we're going to hell because our sin, which we all have. But uh, that's not the case. That's not what the Bible teaches. Because of our sin, which we all have, we start off destined for hell. And you will go to hell unless your sin is forgiven. So John comes preaching and teaching how that sin can be forgiven, how you can be saved. Repentance. Repentance. Now, what is repentance? That's a big church word, right? Well, repentance is simply uh, meaning to change your mind about something and turn away from it. So you turn from it towards something else. It is at once an internal and an external thing, thought and actions together. As an example, it's nearing the end of January, uh, and so you might know. It means I will soon be, soon be starting my annual effort to lose weight. I do it every year, and every year I lose a little bit more. 
And I need to because, well, I watched last week's service online and I noticed, well, the weight's showing in my face and I'm sure some of you noticed it too and I'm sure some of you won't hesitate to tell me because I guess it's, it's all right now to tell people when they're gaining weight. But I'm getting that weight because confession time, this might surprise you about me, I have been celebrating rather merrily over these holidays, these months, with all sorts of desserts and sweets, uh, you know, uh, that I just eat because it's, it's the holiday time, right? And now I need to stop. So I will need to change my mind about those sweets and desserts. I, I need to get in my mind, hey, those aren't good for me. They're not as good for me as I think they must be when I'm eating them. And I will need to turn away from them and turn toward more sensible foods. In my eating, I will repent. In the case of John's teaching, repenting is recognizing the wrong of your sin, which brings death and turning away from it so that you can turn toward God, who is life. Repentance means I'm going to stop doing things my way. I'm going to do things God's way instead. Repentance for the forgiveness of sins. That's what it is. When you repent, your sins are forgiven, meaning you are saved. That's what it means to be saved. You're saved from eternal death in hell unto eternal life with God in heaven. That's John's message. Now, John, he's preaching this before Jesus, just right before Jesus, but before Jesus. And he's teaching it to prepare for Jesus to come and complete the equation because this equation that he's kind of putting out there, it's not complete, right? Right? Jesus comes and he lives the perfect life we are unable to so that he can complete the equation. He can give up his perfection by dying on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins and so that his perfections can then be placed on us. So it is by grace through faith in Jesus that we are saved from our sins. It is totally by the work of Jesus that our sins are forgiven. It is a gift, totally unearned, a gift from God to us. Repentance, which John teaches us in today's passage, is the way we receive this gift of salvation from Christ. It's the way we take ownership of it. We turn from our sin toward Christ for the forgiveness of sins which he has purchased for us. And we are saved. Do you see now why John's message is just so important? We can't skip over this or ignore it. You can't have Christ in your life unless you repent of your sin. You must turn from your sin so that you can turn to Jesus for his gift of salvation. So John's message to the people of his time is the same as it is for us today. Get ready for Jesus in your life. Repent. And then John went on to tell the people not only to repent, but then to produce fruit in keeping with repentance. That's what he told them. Meaning that when we repent, it should produce a change in our lives that is noticeable. That's the fruit John talks about. A noticeable change, a, a byproduct in our lives. See, sadly, a lot of people out there think they're saved when they are not. And they think this because, well, they attend or they have attended church or because their parents are church people or the rest of their family, oh, we're, we're, just a, we're just a church family, right? Or maybe they think this because they, they believe Jesus existed and he was just, I guess, a swell enough guy. It's kind of the same mistake the Jews of John's day were making that he warns them about in our passage today. They think they don't, they're already saved, they, therefore they don't have to take this repentance stuff seriously because, hey, they're Jews, they're descendants of Abraham who was given the promise of God, so that's all we need. But sadly, none of those things that I've just been talking about save people. Because they don't forgive your sins. So your sins are not forgiven because you have not repented. You need to repent. And if it's real repentance, it causes such a deep change in you that it's obvious people see the fruit. That's why we're talking about the need to repent and not the need to repaint. Because repainting, that, that's shallow, right? Uh, repainting is something they do with action figures, toys. You ever, you ever notice this? Uh, they, they make a mold for, for one character. And then uh, instead of going through expense of making another mold, well, they just take this same mold and paint it a different color and say it's a different character, right? 
It's called repainting. It's called a repaint. And it was a very popular thing to do uh, in my favorite line of toys back when I was a kid in the 80s, He-Man and the Masters of the Universe. Hey, take a look at this picture. You can see here that the body for the Man-at-Arms character, which is on the right, it's just a green repaint of the He-Man body on the left. You see, repainting is surfacy and superficial. But repenting is so deep, it comes with evidence of change. True repentance comes with fruit, with evidence. Now, that evidence, that fruit, again, it's not what saves people. But it's an indication that they are saved. If you have repented, your life will be different. The truly repentant person, the person who is saved by turning from their sin toward Jesus, will show it in their lives. That was John's message. And now the people of John's day, they had some questions about this. Oh, what exactly this fruit would look like in their lives? Well, what does it mean? It's just like we have questions today. And so uh, John, in talking with them, gives them three examples or signs of repentance in today's passage. Now, it's not an all-inclusive list. There are other things that, 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 that address repentance. But the saved person, the person who has repented for the forgiveness of sins, will show these signs. They will bear this fruit in their life. And, and, and so we're going to talk about them briefly today. And I want you to consider the evidence for these things in your own life. If they're not there, perhaps you need to do some repenting. The first... The repentant person is others-focused, not self-focused, not self-centered. See, when you turn from your sin, you are turning from self and you are turning to God. When you turn to God, you start uh, to be about what he's about. You start loving what God loves, which is not only you, but it's everybody else all around you. And, and so you look to be focused on them. So John expresses this to the people in today's passage when he says in verse 11, anyone who has two shirts should share with the one who has none. And anyone who has food should do the same. Don't just keep it for yourself, but share, right? This is just another example of God calling for justice for the poor. And his way of seeing that justice done is through those who would claim to follow him in repentance, who would claim repentance in Christ. If you've got extra, stop hoarding it. Give it to those who are in need, who don't have any. You know, I experienced an example of this just this week. I was talking to someone from our congregation, and they indicated that they had taken half of their recent stimulus money, and they'd given it to our deacons fund, which we're collecting for this month. And I was humbled by that, because I hadn't even considered that, to take this suddenly extra stuff that I have, it's more than enough, and to give it like that. Sadly, there are a lot of people in the United States today who are not bearing this particular fruit of repentance. We hold on to the extra we have. We store it up. We use it to gather luxury around us or to live luxury lifestyles while people suffer around us. In one way or another, I think all of us, myself included, need to consider John's words here and consider, are we bearing this fruit of repentance? Maybe there's a place for repenting in our lives. Second, the repentant person will be fair and honest. In verses 12 and 13 of today's passage, even the tax collectors, the tax collectors who, who were by no means known as the righteous ones among the people, they're wanting to repent. They're coming asking uh, what that looks like in their lives. So John tells them, don't collect any more than you're required to. In other words, don't take more than you should. Don't take what's not yours, really. Don't cheat or steal from others to further your own selfish agenda. Be fair and honest. You see, Proverbs 11.1 1 addresses this. God's word, it says, a false balance is an abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. John pretty much says, turn from your cheating, dishonest and unfair ways and balance those scales that's God's way. You know, you who would claim repentance in Christ today, in what ways do you continue to cheat or lie to others for your own gain? In small ways sometimes. How are the scales unbalanced in your reactions with others or your actions with others? The fruit of a truly repentant person is fairness and honesty. Are those present in all areas of your life? 
and how you treat and interact with your spouse and how you earn your living and how much you actually work at your job versus how much you claim to work and get paid for. See, just different little ways. There might be some space for repentance here. And finally, the repentant person is content with what God has provided. We are looking fully at God. You no longer are looking at what your desires tell you that you need, but you're looking to God's provision to supply what is actually needed. You've turned from yourself toward God completely so that you can say with the Apostle Paul, Philippians 4, 19, my God will meet all your needs according to his riches and the glory of Christ. This is what John is getting at in today's passage when the soldiers come to him in verse 14 and they ask what they need to do to repent. And he tells them, don't extort money. Don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. You see, the soldiers, they were in a position of power over the common people. And then they could extort money or other things from the people by treating them harshly or treating them unfairly, kind of like they were the mob and the people. They had to pay their protection money. So John tells them, no, that's not God's way. Remember, God wants you to be others-focused and not self-centered. You can do that by being content with what God has given you. Be content with what you have. God, the only one you look to, has provided everything you need. You who would claim repentance in Christ today, in what ways are you not producing the fruit of repentance that is contentment? Because more so than all these others, I think, in our culture today, this is the one that gets us, right? This is the one that holds us up. We get caught up in, in America, we are just never content. In what ways are you refusing to be content with what God has provided for you? Physically, monetarily, emotionally, relationally. Maybe it's time to do some repenting. Well, do you see why John's message is so important for us today as we want more of Jesus in our lives? All these things that we've just been talking about, uh, just small things can just so easily creep into our lives. The sin and the less noticeable ways of just slightly turning away from God. They can really junk up our lives and leave less room for Jesus and keep us from fully embracing his gift of grace and the joy that it brings us, not only as some far off promise in heaven, but the joy in our lives this very day. So got John's preaching and teaching, it was easy, repentance for the forgiveness of sin. If you haven't done that before, If you haven't renounced your sinful ways and your life and turned toward Jesus and followed after him, won't you do that today? For those of you who have, repentance is an ongoing thing. Sadly, sin creeps into our lives. So notice it. Keep repenting. Keep turning back to Jesus and keep experiencing the joy that is found in the forgiveness of all your sin. Let us pray. Oh, dear God, we thank you so much for giving us Jesus, through whom we have forgiveness of sins. God, when we just when that moment we, we turn to you and follow after you, we are forgiven and we are saved, God. We have the promise of eternal life and so we thank you for that. But God, we admit that there are places, there are corners, and sometimes uh, uh, deep crevices in our lives where sin continues uh, to, to go forth in our lives and we haven't dealt with it. Maybe we haven't even acknowledged it, God. Uh, these simple ways that we kind of turn away from you to our own way. Uh, forgive us for that, God. Make us aware of those things and then strengthen us by your Holy Spirit to to give those over to you, to fully turn to you and say, here, God, it's yours to live life your way instead of our own. May we be always those people who are producing the fruit of repentance. We pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. 
As we turn our attention to your tithes and offerings, I just remind you that if you are a visitor uh, just finding us online today, uh, we're not asking anything from you. But during this time, we look to our, our regular members and our regular attenders who, who have agreed to support our ministry here. You can send your tithes and your offerings to East Brady Baptist Church, 508 Kelly's Way, East Brady, Pennsylvania, 16028, your, your spiritual act of worship through giving. And I'll just remind you that uh, we are collecting this month as our monthly mission for our Deacons Fund, which is uh, uh, the fund we use when we get calls or, or requests from people in our congregation, in our community, uh, for assistance for different things, uh, where we have that set pool of money there so that we can help them out. So if you would like uh, a portion of what you are giving us this week to be put toward the Deacons Fund, please note that when you send it to us and we will make sure it gets to the right place. Uh, well, that brings us to the close of yet another online worship service. Uh, we will conclude with our hymn here in a moment at Calvary. Uh, but before that, let's just close with a benediction. May the grace of Christ our Savior, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you today and always. Amen. <laughs>